One of the things I did with my cap research was that when I found a cap that I'm pretty sure was 18th century, I made a reproduction. I did this by measuring the cap in the museum, extrapolating what the pieces would have looked like, measuring it all, making a pattern, and then putting it together. And then I would go back and compare what the reproduction looked like with the pictures and the drawings that I had from the actual visit and see how close I came. I made a lot of mistakes. I had to figure out how to, for example, take a gathered thing and figure out what that piece would look like when you laid it open and laid it flat. I didn't know how to do that. I learned how to do that. I didn't reproduce every cap that I thought was 18th century, but the, here are 15. I picked the most interesting ones, I think. Um, you'll see that, contrary to the portrait evidence, all but two of the extant caps are lapettes. Well, I exaggerate. There are only two uh, round-eared caps, and they're both from the Smithsonian. There's this one, and there's this one. They're very similar. This one, the ruffle curves around the headpiece, and this one is a straight headpiece. Of the lapettes, this is the most common shape and form right here, where there's a headpiece, a call that is gathered at the top and has a drawstring at the nape, and then some kind of a ruffle or lace. Most common construction. In the 18th century, most caps are put together by cutting the three pieces out, and then, as you can see in this cap, hemming all of the pieces and then putting the pieces together, right? And you can see that construction over and over and over again, where the pieces are hemmed or finished around the edges and then put together. There's so much I want to tell you about these caps. I learned so much. One of the mistakes I made early on was making this gather around the let pet way too tight so that it looks like you've got a little flower here. It's not supposed to look like that. I got better at that later on and it lays down like it's supposed to. Another interesting thing was that I was just about to say that there are no doubled headpieces when I came across this one. And this cap was in Genesee Museum. And indeed, this headpiece is doubled. It's very, 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 it's very super, super fine cloth. And then that doubled headpiece. Yeah, just when you think you're not gonna. And then I was willing to say there are no double calls. But then this one, the whole back is one piece cut and folded in a most intriguing way. It took me a long time to figure out how. So this is all double, except for the ruffle. And it's not made in three pieces. It's just this one, this one piece is all there is to it. And that one is from Westchester Historical Society. Um, I made them all of, most of them of linen. Sometimes I used a cotton organdy or a silk organdy, as in this case, to approximate the look of the original cloth. Of course, we don't have the kinds of cloth that they did. Can't really use the exact same kind of cloth. And then there's this outlier. This was uh, at the DAR Museum, and it's one of those uh, mushroomy caps from very late in the 18th century, probably about 1790. And it's a circle, and then a huge poof gathered on top, like a chef's hat almost. It has no sizing, no gathering in the headpiece, which is also an oddity. This cap, also from Genesee, you can see that it's pieced in many places. The whole back, the whole call here, is pieced in three places. 
I just want to take another minute to look kind of closely at some of the stitching that's being used here. This is an example of super fine stitching. This is my approximation. I didn't really raise to the whole challenge here. On the original, this piece is hemmed, this piece is hemmed, and then they are butted together, and this seam is still only a sixteenth of an inch across. You, I could not find the stitches to count them. They were so small and tiny and precise on the original. This is common to have a whip on the outside, whip stitch on the outside of the ruffle. And this construction is extremely common where there's a rolled whipped gather here. The rolled gather is distinguishable by this popcorn-y shape on the inside. It's almost a shame that's not on the outside. It's so pretty, but that's very common. But some are gathered on the inside and not finished. There are some raw edges, for example, this one. And it was not finished on the inside. It was left raw. So it was put together with a stroke gather and left as a raw edge. Well, that's some of the most interesting things about these. This is one more, one more thing. This, these long strings, <laughs> so the gather at the nape is gathered with these long strings. And how this is done is the string goes in on this side through the channel and is sewn to that side. Then this string goes in the channel and is sewn to this side. So when I pull these, it gathers that. And then this, these are called kissing strings, which I think is kind of fun. And I think most commonly they would have just been tied on top of your head to kind of help hold the cap on. And you could hide it under a ribbon too. Okay, those are some of the highlights. I hope that um, you will have lots and lots of questions that we can talk about when we meet. And I will be so happy to answer them. It's not hard to get me started, it's just hard to get me stopped. Thanks for listening.